Good morning, everybody. Welcome to worship this morning on this um, Christ the King Day, um, Reign of Christ Day, as some of uh, call it, at the end of the liturgical year and the Sunday before the first Sunday in Advent, which is next week. Wow. Um, it's also the week before Thanksgiving, so um, wishing you a blessed Thanksgiving to thank the Lord for the blessings that the Lord God has bestowed on us all through the year. Um, it would probably take us forever to even mention them all. So a happy Thanksgiving week to everybody. This Wednesday, this Wednesday there will be, uh, or no, it's on Tuesday, Tuesday, November 23rd. Um, the Dunmore Church and uh, this church came together, the sessions, and wanted to hold a community Thanksgiving service uh, together. And so we're going to do that at 7 o'clock at the church on 137 Chestnut Street, Dunmore. Um, Dunmore has advised me that there will be refreshments afterwards. And uh, not to be outdone as Presbyterians, I'm sure we can bring our own refreshments, too, to share. Um, in the fellowship time following the service. Um, you see all the other uh, announcements. I'm not sure anything needs clarification. Darlis, do you want to say anything about any of them? It's good. Right, right. That's this coming Saturday. Uh, we're doing the hanging of the greens. And uh, if you can volunteer to help with that, there is a sign up sheet in the back. And also, Cookies uh, orders are being taken. Um, you can sign up a cookie order on the sheets in the back, or you can see uh, Linda Galka, um, and uh, she will take, uh, that's her phone number on there too, and so you can call them in this year. Uh, the deadline is gonna be the first Sunday in December, is that right? Yes, December 5th for orders. Um, but we can always use more bakers. Are there other announcements that we need to take today? I just want to bring up two concerns um, uh, to keep in your prayers and thoughts the family of um, uh, Joe Clark. That's Millie's brother. Uh, the family has, um, he's, he's in the hospital, and the family has um, elected to uh, discontinue his life support. So that's, he's, um, in fact, that was going to be happening today, so um, he may not still be with us, but uh, uh, Millie said that she would contact us um, as soon as that happens, but she's hoping for prayers and concerns for that. Uh, she's already lost one brother this past year, and now it looks like she's going to lose two. Also, um, um, Carol Thomas, um, Alan Thomas's wife, is now at uh, the Julia Roboto Center um, that's, um, that's outside Lake Ariel. Um, and and uh, I will get that address for you, but uh, uh, she's, she's gonna be a permanent resident there because she cannot live at home. And um, Alan's doing a lot of shuttle ministry back and forth there. And with the uh, extra challenge of raising Ethan too, um, Please keep that family in your prayers. And he said he would love cards and letters to her and prayers as well. So I will get you that address. Are there, Bonnie? Okay. All right. Andrea, Andrea, Andrea White is at, was at CMC, but we're not sure if she's still there or not. The, the, the oh yeah, that's um, uh, Carol Thomas is there. Okay. Then let us focus our hearts and minds on the worship of God this morning with our prelude.
grace and peace to you from him who is and was and who is to come. And from Jesus Christ. Well, please join me in our call to worship. <laughs> Grace and peace to you from him who is and was and who is to come. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead. He, he is, is the ruler, ruler of the kings, kings of the earth. earth. All, All praise, praise to him who loves us and has freed, freed us from our sins by his blood. Under his realm, he made us to be a kingdom, priests serving his God and Father. Let us praise and worship God. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Please join your hearts with mine in a prayer of adoration. Gracious Father, Holy Spirit, Christ, the King of glory, you choose to take on our flesh so that we might be free of fleshly bonds. Though you are Lord of the universe, you chose a humble birth in a borrowed stall. You chose to live a humble life with ordinary folks. You lived a nomadic life to spread the good news of your kingdom, where the last is first, the poor and distressed are blessed, the hungry will be filled with good food, the blind will see and the lame will walk. Then you secured our place in your kingdom by choosing to hand yourself over to be sacrificed. You overcame death itself and opened heaven's gates to all who believe that the kingdom of heaven is within us when you are seated upon the throne of our lives. Give us open minds and hearts to perceive your kingdom in our midst so that we may continue in the work you began in us. Amen. Please join me in our opening hymn, We Gather Together, page 336. From distressing, sing praises to his name, he forgets not his own. Beside us to guide us, our God with us joining, ordaining, maintaining his kingdom divine. So from the Winning, our Lord was at our side. All glory be thine. We all do extol thee, thou lead a triumphant, and pray that thou still our defender wilt be. Let thy congregation escape tribulation. Thy name be ever praised, O Lord, make us free. As King of kings and Lord of lords, Jesus made the way for us to know life in all its fullness, offering us forgiveness and hope, as well as refreshment and renewal. So let us trust in him as we make our confession. Merciful God, you have given us glimpses of your heavenly realm through the life, death, and rising of Jesus our Lord. We admit that that while you yearn to move towards you through the light of Christ, our sinful nature continues to be an obstacle. Forgive us when we are quick to accuse others of their faults, 
while we are blind to our own shortcomings. Forgive us when we squander the bounteous gifts you have given us and forget the many blessings you have provided. Forgive us when we forget or ignore your word to us. We humbly ask for your mercy and compassion. Remember that we are dust and pour out your Holy Spirit into our lives so that washed in your grace and love, that day by day we will move closer and closer to being the people you have called us to be. Amen. The res resurrection of Jesus has proven that the grace of God is stronger than even death. The love of God has no boundaries. This is such good news. In Jesus Christ, the obstacles have been removed, and through the forgiveness, we are renewed, that he, and he has graciously provided for us. Amen. Our responsive reading is Psalm 93 page 479 in your Bible. The Lord is king. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed. He is girded with strength. He has established the world. It shall never be moved. Your, your throne, throne is established, established from, from of old. And you, you are from everlasting. everlasting. The floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their roaring. More, more majestic than, than the thunders of mighty waters. More majestic than the waves of the sea. Majestic on high is the Lord. Your decrees are very sure. Holiness befits your house, O Lord, forevermore. If you will join me, um, I stand and state what we believe using words from Philippians. Christ, Christ Jesus, Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess to the glory of God. Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be. Amen, amen. So forgiven and full of peace, let us turn to one another and pass that same sign of peace, I know from our seats and not from walking around shaking hands, but uh, peace be with you all. Peace to you. Peace, everybody. <laughs> Well, I have another confession to make. When I got here, Tim said, are you sure you got the scripture readings right? They're not making sense. And I thought he meant maybe our Old Testament reading. But then I turned to the page in the Bible that I said we would be reading for the gospel, and that's not it. Oh. So I'll give you that when we get to that place. So thank you for the heads up, Tim, or I would have been completely awash. Um, 
So we are, uh, please just join our hearts together and we'll have a prayer for illumination. Gracious God, may your spirit fill our hearts and minds so that we might hear what you would have us hear and be who you would have us be. For the sake of Jesus Christ, your word of truth made flesh. Amen. Our Old Testament reading is from Daniel chapter 1, uh, verses 7 through 18. And um, just a little introduction. We often hear this passage in terms of apocalyptic lit uh, literature and quotations and predictions and the beasts that are going to rule the earth. Um, we often think of that as something that's going to happen in the future. We have to also pay attention to the people who heard it the first time and what it meant to them. They were people who were oppressed. The Jewish people had been overrun by the Babylonians. They were hauled off into exile, removed from everything they loved and, and knew. And the beasts represent, even now, you know, earthly powers that can do evil and devour and hurt. And so listen to the words of Daniel's vision in that context. In the first year of King Belshazzar of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head as he lay in bed. And then he wrote down the dream. I, Daniel, saw in my vision by night the four winds of heaven stirring up the great sea. And four great beasts came up out of the sea, different from one another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. And then as I watched, its wings were plucked off and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand up on two feet like a human being. And a human mind was given it. Another beast appeared, a second one that looked like a bear. It was raised up on one side, had three tusks in its mouth among its teeth and was told, arise. Devour many bodies. After this, I, as I watched, another appeared. Like a leopard, the beast had four wings of a bird on its back and four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this, I saw in the visions by night a fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful, exceedingly strong. It had great iron teeth and was devouring, breaking in pieces and stamping what was left with its feet. It was different from all the other beasts that preceded it. It had 10 horns. I was considering the horns when another horn appeared, a little one coming up among them to make room for it. Three of the earlier horns were plucked up by the roots. There were eyes like human eyes in this horn and a mouth, speaking arrogantly. As I watched, thrones were set in place, and an ancient one took his throne. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, and its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and flowed out from his presence. A thousand thousand served him, and 10,000 times 10,000 stood attending him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. I watched them because of the noise of the arrogant words that the horn was speaking. And as I watched, that beast was put to death, and its body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. As I watched in the night visions, I saw one like a human coming with clouds of heaven. And he came to the ancient one and was presented before him. To him was given dominion and glory and kinship that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion was an everlasting dominion, and that shall not pass away. And his kingship is one that shall never be destroyed. As for me, Daniel, my spirit was troubled within me, and the visions of my head terrified me. I approached one of his attendants to ask him the truth concerning all this. So he said that he would disclose to me the interpretation of the matter. 
As for these four great beasts, four kings shall rise out of the earth, but the holy ones of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, forever and ever. And so I'm trying to think, I did look it up here, what exactly we're looking at here for John. And it is actually chapter 18, not one. <laughs> and then we go through 19. Um, it's still 28 through 16. And that's on page 880. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you make against this man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, well, take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. And the Jews replied, and this would be the leaders of the Jews, we are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated what kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again and summoned Jesus. He asked him, are you king of the Jews? Jesus answered, do you ask this on your own or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I'm not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. So Pilate asked Jesus, so you are a king. And Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this I was born. For this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, what is truth? After Pilate said this, he went out again to the crowd and told them, I find no case against him. You have a custom that I release someone for you at Passover. Don't you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to the crowd, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus went out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, here is the man. When the chief priest and the police saw him, they shouted, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. But they answered him, we have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die because he has claimed to be the son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you? Power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, you would have no power over me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him. But the crowd cried out, if you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. 
Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. Well, when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the crowd, here is your king. And they cried, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate asked them, shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, we have no king but the emperor. And then he handed him over to them to be crucified. The word of the Lord. Thank you. Be to God. Today is Christ the King Sunday. I realize that my pages are messed up. <laughs> my, my thing, I'm going to see if I can figure this out. If my printer gets mixed up um, and prints things backwards and then I try to put them in the right order and I never know how they're going to come out. So we are going to just switch this around a bit. I am very sorry. Let's see. I tried to fix it so it wouldn't do that, and I thought it listened, but I guess it didn't. <laughs> so you understand. I know you do. <laughs> you have fights with yours, too. So I'm just glad when it works. I try not to complain too much, and it's when it can hear me. Um, <laughs> I guess then it'll show me. So we're almost there, and it's missing the first page. But we're talking about Christ the King Sunday talking about this special time that's kind of a precipice at the end of our church year cycle. And as Jesus is Alpha and Omega, and the cycle turns, he's at the beginning and the end and all through the cycle. But I think about us um, as we prepare to get ready for celebrating the birth of Christ. We have time on Thursday to give thanks for our year, for what we've been given and blessed with and then comes Black Friday and everybody's out trying to get ready for Christmas but um, I think that we have this special time that's set apart is to take a moment and pause to uh, reflect about the nature of temporary earthly kingdoms and relationship to the eternal realm of heaven <coughs> We have time to think about what our true identity is under the rule whose legislation boils down to love. Love our creator with all our hearts and minds and strength and to love each other and our neighbor as ourselves. As we prepare to receive anew the one who is the light of the world, we do take this moment to ponder the darkness that can only be overcome by the one who is, who was, and is to come again. It gives us time to think about Daniel's vision when frightening earthly beasts seem to rule, devouring and destroying in their dominions, not caring for the people that they are charged to care for. As Christians, we look at Daniel as prophecy for the time when Jesus will come again. But in Daniel's time, that vision was also a comfort for those oppressed and abused by invaders. The time of our gospel scripture took place on a totally different sort of Black Friday, the one that we have coming up after Thanksgiving. It was the original Black Friday, which we have come to know, know now as Good Friday. The Jewish leaders were afraid they were afraid of the following that Jesus was getting. The masses meeting him wherever he went, hoping for a glimpse of a miracle or a chance to touch his garment. The throngs that celebrated his entry into Jerusalem for the Passover could easily erupt into a zealous riot, and certainly there were insurgents among them. The religious leaders had been able to secure a precarious peace with the Roman Empire, by squelching zealots and those who would rebel. In doing so, 
They were afforded the forbearance to worship according to their religious laws and traditions. But not only had Jesus drawn attention to himself with his large and enthusiastic crowd of followers, he had also cast aspersions on the leaders, calling them hypocrites and challenging their practices in front of the people. If they could, they would have tried him for blasphemy. But the Jewish leaders had no authority under Roman law to rid themselves of this thorn in their side, even under their own law. So they brought him before Pilate, the Roman prefect, charged with keeping law in order. They wanted Jesus to be charged with sedition under Roman law, treasonous acts which threatened the authority of the emperor, acting above the law or equal to the king of the land or equal to God. Pilate sent him on to Herod, who sent him back to Pilate because neither of them could understand why anyone would want this man dead. Pilate, realizing the buck had been passed back to him, asked Jesus, so are you king of the Jews? Jesus did what he often did. He answered the question with another question. Are you asking this for yourself or have you heard it from others? And Pilate says, I'm not Jewish, what would I know? Be your own, but your own nation, your own chief priests have handed you over to me. What on earth have you done to make them so angry that they would have you killed? Now Jesus did not outright say he was a king, but he certainly implied it when he said, my kingdom is not, out, is not of this world. He said he had come from this other world to testify to the truth. And he said that people who belong to the truth of that other kingdom would be the only ones to listen to his voice. So Pilate answered with this fairly famous question, what is truth? Well, Jesus came to the world to point to a truth that is not of this world. So how was he going to answer Pilate? Jesus was not, as they say, from around here. Jesus' kingdom is heaven. Kingship in heaven is not what it's been in this world, where power is gained and maintained with force and violence. And I'm sure this was a concept that Pilate could not easily grasp. His only frame of reference being the aggressive and ambitious rule of the Roman Empire, of which he had been sworn to protect. In heaven, God's truth is God's governance. It is what reigns over us, a law that is enacted in our hearts and guides us to a more abundant life. The truth of heaven is not the way we perceive it on earth. In our world, we are taught to understand truth as a set of facts, cognitive knowledge that can be verified and proven with a logical relationship with other sets of facts. But in the realm of heaven, Jesus himself is the truth, the way, the truth, and the life the truth of God's extravagant and self-giving love. When Jesus handed himself over to be scorned, shamed, crucified, to be resurrected, he proclaimed that his way, his truth, his life, is not only powerful, but it, it is the reconciliation of worldly kingdoms with heaven. We belong to his true kingdom when we hear his voice and follow. Belonging to the truth is not so much a matter of what we know, what we understand. It is what we embody. For we are all born with the image of God implanted in our souls. When we hear the truth of Christ's voice, it is like a compass that impels us to follow the true way to abundant life. Jesus outright said to Pilate that he did not come to take over the world with armies and violence. If Jesus wanted to, he certainly had the power. There is no way Pilate or anyone else could have restrained him. If Jesus had come to conquer Rome with armies, there is no way he would have been whipped or spit upon, and those who tried would have suffered greatly. The kings and leaders of this world seek to secure their places of power. They demand obedience and exercise their power with military force. The kings and leaders of this world use their power to take from others, they tax people who have little so that they might live more opulently. Even elected le leaders in our day 
offer, uh, um, leave office richer than when they entered, and not because they are paid well, but because they influence the laws that benefit them financially. They have benefits, their benefits that they provide to those who are su they are supposed to serve is meager in comparison. The truth of our world is that even the most benevolent of kings and leaders are disconnected from the reality of their subjects' lives. They do not maintain their positions without exertion of power. Now we accept these leaders as necessary. They keep our world organized. The Bible even tells us that God affirms them. And if it were not so, Pilate, Herod, and the chief priests would have been in chains and nailed to the crosses while Jesus and his disciples took over the government. But Jesus was and is king from a higher order of government, more powerful than any earthly nation or kingdom. Yet he chose not to wield his power over them. He did not use his power to enrich himself and his friends. Jesus is the shepherd king that God intended kings to be. Jesus, the way, the truth, the life. He came to testify to the truth that there is a way back home for those who have been held captive by the ways of this world, by the evil one who would deceive us into believing that consumerism and greed and power grabbing is all that matters, or that we have gone so far astray that God would never have us back. Jesus came to show us the truth. No, this is not all there is. He came to lead us to the eternal place for where we belong with our Father, with our Father the Holy Spirit, and with him. Jesus came to teach us the truth about his kingdom, where everyone is loved and valued, where God's children are not measured by the standards of status, material goods, or power over others. And yet... We are not here to wait until we leave this world in order to be part of the next. We are here to participate in life as we are meant to do here on earth. We would not be here if God did not intend us to be here. So as followers of Christ, we are called to be kind of dual citizens, alive and active in this world, while mindful that there is more beyond us even in between the molecules that hold us together. We pay Caesar what belongs to Caesar, and we give to God what belongs to God. I believe that God sent us here to make the most we can of our experience on earth in the short time we have here, for some purpose, for doing something, learning something, or just for the development of our souls. I'm not sure what, but I do believe we are here for a reason. And even though we walk in temporary bodies through the temporary kingdoms of our lives, our homes, our families, communities, congregations, counties, states, country, our world, and even the solar system, we are mindful that it is all part of the circle of God's eternal realm. For right now is every bit a part of eternity. Jesus said he came to testify to this truth. Truth is not so much as what we know, but who we know and to whom we belong. And we belong to God, and the truth is that God is love. Our awareness or lack of awareness of this truth does not change the truth. Our awareness, however, does influence our belief about the truth. Once I had a discussion with someone who undoubtedly was a faithful Christian, but who disagreed with me on some theological point. And he said, there is only one truth. God's truth doesn't change. As I pondered this, I realized, yes, God's truth is unchangeable. But our understanding of it does change as we go through life's experiences. That emerging understanding is how we make the most of our journey as spiritual beings living in a material world. Just as the truth is what is with that just as the truth is what it is without our understanding, Christ is king with or without our knowledge or allegiance. With our dual citizenship, we straddle a gap between what is and what should be, between what is and what will be. As we say in the Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we are truly blessed to have Christ as our king 
Though he knows the truth in a way we cannot comprehend, he has also been there as one of us. He made himself part of our world and understands our complexities. With his own outstretched arms, he made a bridge for us so crossing the gap was made possible. He calls us to follow him into the kingdom of truth where he reigns forever and ever in glory. So please join your hearts and mine in prayer. Loving God, you are king of all that we can see and all that we can't even imagine. Instill in us your values of love as we walk in a world that seems to be the opposite sometimes. Strengthen us as we grow and conform in your image and live into the heavenly kingdom to which we belong. Amen. Do we have any other joys and concerns to share for our prayers? I would um, continue to add. I have a a couple of joys that I forgot to mention. We welcome back Commission Pastor Lori Lockney. (laughs) She's taking over the reins for quite some time now, so that's wonderful. And we welcome back organist Jamie Strong, who was away last week, but now has returned. And one other joy I'd like to mention um, congratulations to the Valley View football uh, squad who achieved um, the district championship and now are moving on to a state title. And uh, one of those squad members just happens to be sitting in a pew back there. Ah. Stick your hand up, James. <laughs> James? And to the other football, um, which... Um, referred to football in Europe, uh, but we refer to it as soccer, uh, two of those squad members are sitting on either side. (laughs) Other joys today. How about uh, concerns that we uh, haven't raised before? Bonnie? Linda Guzzi. And George Karsnack. George Karsnack. Okay. I'm going to um, ask for continued prayers for my friends Chelsea and Jeff who are battling cancer. Please join your hearts with mine. Holy and loving God, in you is more love than we can imagine and more grace than we can fathom. You have shown yourself in Jesus Christ as a God who meets us where we are and loves us as we are. We are glad for this day and grateful for your many gifts. You bring good things into our lives, more than we can name, more than we can number. You give us the bread of life sustaining our souls and feeding our deepest hungers, and you accompany us on our way. Thank you for your abundant faithfulness. Today we are especially thankful for many joys. For sports teams that are faithful to the discipline and are successful and victorious, becoming champions, and grateful for the leadership that your servant James has displayed, that he is a witness for you amongst that competition. We welcome back everyone who's been away. We're grateful for our Thanksgiving feasts, our big meals, and if we can gather with family and friends, or having fellowship and worship with other Christians as we celebrate abundant life in Christ. And we are mindful all the while of those who find little abundance and grateful for the gifts that are given to the Jessup Food Pantry and for the ministry that they are supplying others who are hungry. We're grateful for this congregation for its many ways that it celebrates the church year, greens and cookies, fundraising to keep everything going as we look forward to the celebration of our Savior's birth. 
Our hearts are full of many things today. Disease and death and pain and sorrow are constantly among us. The journey through these days is marked by uncertainty and heartache. We are frequently overwhelmed by the needs around us and within us. Some need healing, some need encouragement, some need comfort, some need assurance. We all need hope. So we turn to you, asking you to hear our prayers and grant what we need for the living of these days. Today we are especially concerned for the family of Joel Clark as they accompany him through his most likely to be his last days. You grant him and them peace as he journeys home to you. For the family of Linda Guzzi also, may you bring them comfort and peace. For those in the hospital and nursing homes, for Andrea and Carl, Carol and George, for everyone in our bulletin, For Gary and Bob and Marilyn, Frank and Pat, Charles, Tim, Alberta, Betty, Tina, Paul, Jerry, Suzette, Sue, Tom, Kina, Marge, Walt, Bev, Florence, Shirley, Gretchen, George, Stephanie, Wade, Carol, John, Marianne, and Neil, Rebecca and Lisa, Nikki, Grace, Carol and Alan, Pearl, Yolanda, Mary Beth, everyone who's feeling isolated, people everywhere who are sitting in nursing homes and unable to visit with others. Lord, we also pray for our nation. Help us to remember that we are only one of the many nations that you care about. We pray for renewed commitments to our common life. Pray for our leaders to overcome self-interest for the good of many. Refresh in us the values of your heart for justice and righteousness, compassion, mercy, and peace. Help us to find a unity of purpose as citizens and neighbors. We pray for your church in places near and far. May the waters of your grace continually refresh and empower us to extend the love of Jesus to all people, and especially for our own denomination, for the clarity of our witness and the success of our mission. We pray for this congregation, for our life together, for our efforts to follow in the way of Jesus. Hear our prayers, O Lord, and help us. Heal us, hold us. For the sake of our Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and, and the, the glory, glory forever. forever. Amen. And though we don't physically take our offering and have left our gifts in the back, we do remember our gratitude for God's faithfulness and with thanksgiving for all we have received that we have brought these gifts. Oh, we have to sing the hymn first. Thank you so much. <laughs> Jesus Shall Reign, page 265. Get my Bible again. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus shall reign where the sun does its successive journeys run. His kingdom stretch from shore to shore. 
Till moon shall wax and away no more To him shall endless prayer be made And the praises throng to crown his head His name like sweet perfume shall rise with every morning sacrifice. People and realms of every tongue dwell on his love with sweetest song and infant voices shall proclaim their early blessings on his name blessings abound where Prisoners leap to loose their chains. The weary find eternal rest, and all who suffer want are blessed. Let every creature. And bring honors peculiar to our King. Angels descend with songs again, and earth repeat the loud Amen. the gifts that we have brought um, with thanksgiving for all that we have received. And we'll listen to the offertory. God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Faith and hope, we offer our gifts, 
Use them, even as you use us, to accomplish your purposes in Jesus Christ, the head of our church, the Lord of our lives, who reigns as the true king over this world and the next. Amen. Amen. And our closing hymn is page 363. Rejoice, the Lord is King, your Lord and King adored. Rejoice, give thanks and sing, and triumph evermore. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say rejoice. Our Savior Jesus reigns, the Lord of truth and love. When he had purged our stains, he took his seat above. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, Rejoice again, I say rejoice. His kingdom cannot fail. He rules o'er earth and heaven. The keys of death and hell are to our Jesus given. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say rejoice. Rejoice in glorious hope, for Christ the judge shall come. And gather all the saints to their eternal home. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say rejoice. It is time to go again, rejoicing in the sanctuary to rejoicing by being the sanctuary for others. So let us go from this place trusting that God is with us and for us in every place, knowing that his truth and love prevail over any kings and principalities that might affect our daily lives. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the companionship of the Holy Spirit be with us all and abide with us this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen.